So I'll just give it another minute or so. I think some, some people have started to enter now. So I think one of the sessions might be running a bit long. Don't worry, I'm not in a rush. <laughs> okay. Hi everyone, we'll just go ahead and get started in a minute. Leave it for a few more people to join. So we'll go ahead and get started and I think a couple more people will join us when the, the previous session that's just running over is finished. Um, so thank you for joining us uh, on track one and I'm really pleased to welcome the wonderful um, Professor Sarah Tabrizi who has done so much for the Huntington's disease community. So today she'll be talking with us um, about the research staging system study that she's part of and again if you have any questions throughout if you put them in the Q&A or the chat areas, these will be looked at at the end of the session. So I'll now hand over to Sarah. Thank you very much. Thanks, Hayley, and thanks for inviting me to speak. Um, I'm going to tell you all about this new HD integrated staging system, which is the way forward now for all clinical trials. And it's going to allow us to do clinical trials much earlier in the disease course. So I'm going to tell you about what is a research framework, what's a staging system, and why do we urgently need one in Huntington's disease, tell you about what our working group did, tell you the HD biological research definition, details about the staging system, the impact, and then I'll take any questions. So I chaired this HD regulatory science forum working group, and this was part of the Huntington's Regulatory Science Consor Consortium, and it was made up of HD researchers, clinician scientists, and representatives from pharmaceutical and biotech companies, all with clinical HD programs. And the people below, uh, uh, listed here down below, were part of the team. The working group objective was to propose an HD research framework that addresses the entire disease continuum to enable HD clinical trials before clinical motor diagnosis when we have the greatest chance of making a big difference. So what is a research framework? Well, this is entirely for research purposes and it's not for clinical practice at all. The, flip, the framework includes both a research definition and a staging system. Researchers can use this to analyze data, for example, and drug companies will use it to decide which participants to include in a trial. This does not affect how a doctor would diagnose their patients. It is not diagnostic criteria and it's not clinical guidelines. So what is a research definition? So a case definition in research is a set of standard criteria for classifying whether a person has a particular disease, syndrome, or other health condition. And case definitions are critically important in research as it allows you to clearly define who will be in your study. Now, clinical staging and staging systems classify clusters of patients or subjects into broad groups. The subjects in each stage share similar features and expected outcomes and require similar treatments. 
For example, the best established staging system is used in cancer and it has revolutionized cancer trials. In a staging system, you have stage boundaries, which are based on specific milestones or landmarks. Each landmark is a specific assessment or biomarker. And the criteria for going from one stage to another is based on the landmark cutoff values. And I'll use the um, example of cancer here. Stage one to stage two cancer, the landmark cutoff is the size of the tumor. And the staging system, as I mentioned, in cancer has transformed clinical trials, allowing them to treat much earlier. And it's also tra transformed heart disease, stroke, and many other diseases. Why does Huntington's disease need a new definition and staging system? Before the discovery of the gene, researchers still had to be certain who did or did not have Huntington's disease for their work. Therefore, the diagnosis was made on something called the DCL4, diagnostic confidence, and it had to be made when Huntington's disease symptoms were absolutely unmistakable, i.e. very advanced. And this led to clinical diagnosis being based on motor features. But relying on clinical motor diagnosis for research and for trials is difficult. One, the diagnostic criteria are subjective, dependent on the doctor who's examining you. The terms pre-manifest and manifest don't have precise definitions. Therefore, comparing results across different research studies is challenging because we don't have a precise definition for these words. And also motor diagnosis occurs very late in Huntington's disease. And we know that other signs, symptoms, and underlying biological changes exist much earlier. And this makes it very difficult for us to do trials to include earlier participants in the hope of doing prevention trials in the future. So the reason we developed the staging system was so we could plan for future prevention trials. Well, so where are we? We had the working group who worked over three years to examine thousands and thousands of data sets. We had input from HD families and patients who were very supportive and in, input from the FDA and the regulators. We had review externally and now our publication is in press at the Lancet Neurology. The biological research definition of Huntington's disease that the consortium came up with after a lot of discussion is that Huntington's disease is defined as the presence of a CAG repeat expansion in exon one of the Huntington gene of 40 or more CAG repeats. 36 or more has to also have the presence of a disease-specific biomarker or disease-specific clinical syndrome because some people with 36 to 39 repeats may never develop the disease. And, there, and we need to do future research to establish criteria to define Huntington's disease in the CAG 36 to 39 range. So the following staging criteria that I'm going to pre present to you are really for individuals with 40 or more CAG repeats. And this is an illustration of the staging system. Stage zero, one, two, and three. And we know that subjects are born with the Huntington's uh, uh, gene expansion, and they will follow this trajectory but they may follow different paths, as you can see here. Some people have faster progression, some people have slower progression. But what we know is that they go along this rate general trajectory. And what we have developed is these, these four, four stages. And 
each of the stages has a gate and those gates are actually landmarks. And so there are two gates at each of the stages. And stage zero is when basically there is absolutely nothing to find. People are completely well. It would be a bit like the cohort I studied, the HD young adult study. They are completely fine. Stage one is when you get a detectable biomarker change. Stage two is when you see a detectable clinical sign or symptom. And stage three is when there is detectable functional change or decline in independence. And I'll go into this in more detail. So the landmarks we chose from tens of thousands of data sets. We then chose 2,800 potential landmarks and we worked on, on uh, honing them down until we had the very most robust landmarks that had been tested in more than one study and had been tested longitudinally. Stage zero is the presence of a CAG 40 or more and nothing else. Stage one is the landmarks are chordate volume or putamen volume. A change in the chordate volume or the putamen volume above a certain cutoff. And I'll come on and talk about cutoffs. Stage two is a landmark with a change in total motor score or symbol digit modality tests above the um, normative cutoffs. And again, functional decline is a change in independent scale or total functional capacity. Now, these were chosen out of 2,800 variables as showing the most strong association with HD progression and that had been validated in many thousands of data sets and more than one study. We have three categories for stage three. Mild, which means the individual does not require any assistance with routine activities. Moderate, requires some assistance. And severe, the individual cannot perform routine activities independently. And so this is it mapped all together. Stage zero is when there's just the presence of the gene. Stage one, putamen and chordate volume changes. It's and or chordate volume changes. Stage two, change in total motor score or symbol digit. Stage three, a change in total functional capacity or independent scale. And, it, and the path is along this. We are particularly interested in doing trials in stage zero, stage one, and stage two, which is as early as we possibly can for future prevention trials. And at the moment, because we don't have a staging system, the regulators have not allowed us to do these studies. But this staging system is going to set the path for future prevention studies. So how did we determine those cutoffs or landmarks or gates? We modeled data from thousands of individuals who did not carry the Huntington gene. This was similar to how growth curves from the WHO were developed. And we picked a cutoff for what is an outlier if they scored beyond the fifth percentile for an assessment. And for example, CAG greater than 40, chordate volume was less than the fifth percentile for their age, they would be stage one. And so we, uh, uh, man we did these sorts of curves and when someone was above or below the fifth percentile, this is, for example, here on a growth curve, then they would be classified in that stage. And we had to use normal control data. So if you can see here, for a, a child who's 10 months old, they have to, if they weigh less than, than 
about 6.8 kilograms, they are less than the fifth percentile. And this is how we made the normative cutoffs for the gates. So how well does the HD integrated staging system describe what we know about Huntington's disease? Well, all participants could be easily matched with a stage at 87% of their study visits. 89 of participants, and this is from tens of thousands of individuals collected through enroll and other studies, increased through the stages over time, and for each CAG group, patterns of disease were consistent with the HDISS. So what's the impact? We've developed a biological definition of Huntington's disease that con considers the spectrum of known repeat expansions and an evidence-based staging system that fills a critical gap that we need in HD research. It has positive impact packs on advancing therapeutic development for trials. It unifies research terminology for Huntington's disease. It allows us to compare across populations, across different clinical trials. And importantly, it creates a framework for intervention before clinical motor diagnosis. It allows the definition of study populations across the entire duration of the disease trajectory, including very early stage zero. And it paves the way for trials and treatments earlier in the progression of HD with the hope to prevent or delay disease progression. And when we discussed it with patients and families and young people, they were very supportive of the idea of a stage zero. So we know if it's only a doc, it will only, it is only for research, but we recognize that this may impact families. But the feedback we've had so far has been overwhelmingly positive in that families have been waiting for a staging system to recognize the spectrum of, uh, uh, of carrying the gene across a lifetime. And as they say, we've had a very positive feedback about the stage zero, which I hope we're going to be able to do stage zero and one trials in the future once we have uh, therapies that are suitable. So first of all, I'd like to thank you for listening. This was a whistle-stop tour of the HD staging system. It's now in press at the Lancet Neurology. I presented it last week at the CHDI conference. And I think importantly, this work would never have been possible without the vital contribution of all the HD research participants and their families who helped collect all the data, including the normal control data. And the community's dedication to research has allowed for the development of the HD integrated staging system. And I'm, I'd like to thank you for listening and I'm happy to take any questions. Hello, hello. It's Hi, been a while. Seth. I'm, uh, I know I surprised you. I, uh, I am taking over as the co-host here. So thank you so much for sharing this important information. And you were at the meeting last week as well, weren't you? CHDI? No, I wasn't at the oh, meeting. Oh, I thought you were there. I wish oh, I, I, wish I was. Oh, I would have come up, come up to you. And if, yeah, if I yeah, was. Yeah. But, I presented um, this last week as well. That, no, that's awesome. I think what's what's great about this, and this is something that I've, I've, I'm i glad you touched on, is kind of the piece about how it's, it could be similar to, you know, the cancer staging, right, and trying to get prevention trials, because if we look at the cancer space, right, if you find out you have the BRCA gene, you're given options that may Absolutely. work. Absolutely. We, we that's aren't sure, exactly you know. right, Seth. So this now is coming out in a very good journal. The community is on board. And this means that if you're stage zero or stage one, uh, and stage zero is you just have the gene. Mm -hmm. And uh, it gives us the opportunity to offer participants to be in trials that could be potentially disease modifying at that stage, years and years before they show motor signs. Absolutely. And it might be that by the time you shows severe motor signs that it might be too late for some of the therapies and that's what looks like it happened in the Tominersen trial. 
Absolutely. Yeah. No, you're right. I mean, the goal, right, is to treat as early as possible, not until by the time they're sick, it might be too late. Um, And, you know, what question for you is, you know, and I was looking just at the staging system is like, it looks like with stage two involves kind of more of these motor biomarkers where stage three may have more cognitive. By maybe yeah, so stage so. two is any change above a cutoff in your total motor score or any change um, above a cutoff in your symbol digit modality test, which is a cognitive test. So stage two would still be in the traditional old sense, prodromal. Stage three is when you have a change in your function, okay. particularly total functional capacity. The endpoints in a stage two trial would be, could be motor and cognitive, whereas endpoints in a stage three trial will still be function and um, uh, composite UHDRS. And actually, if you look at the Generation HD1 cohort study that Roche did, now we've mapped it onto the HDISS. Nearly all of that cohort were very late stage three, which meant very advanced disease. And, and that being said, I know it's been a lot of discussion, even at the CHDI conference last week, I was following along an HD buzz on Twitter, is what about like uh, neurofilament light chain and or neuroimaging? Where does that fall yes. into all of this? So neuroimaging is part of stage one with the chordate okay. and putamen volume. So okay. you have to have an MRI scan for that. I did get asked about CSF neurofilament as well, Uh, last week. So CSF neurofilament is going to go in there. Um, What we had to have is very strict criteria that the regulators insisted on. And we had to have data in thousands of individuals with longitudinal data, which is over time. Mm -hmm. And it had to be validated in more than one group. CSF neurofilament is is going to get there, but it's not been done in thousands of people longitudinally and validated. So I fully expect to be putting CSF neurofilament in stage zero and one, but we just have to wait for the data because we have to produce those normative cutoffs, if that makes sense. It does. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's all, and I, I get it. It's all about getting the right data. And, and I guess that being said, You know, one thing that's interesting that I've learned is that, you know, how do we get more young adults involved in research so we can collect that data so that we better understand? Well, I think that's very important. I think we do want to do trials in stage zero and stage one. And I'm running the HD Young Adult Study, which is following up a cohort of people who are in stage zero. But we need people all over the world who are in stage zero or stage one to come forward to be in in studies like Enroll, like Clarity, because the more data we can get in things like CSF neurofilament in that group, the more it's going to help the um, staging system move forward for trials, because we don't yet have enough data for, for CSF neurofilament. And that's why getting involved in research, observational research, as a young person is so important because it contributes to things to studies like this and allows us to work with the FDA and work with the European Medicines Agency and say, hey, you know, we want to do a trial much, much earlier because we think this is the time when we can make the biggest difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think what, what we need to do it just from my own personal experience is we got to meet them where they are, right. Is, is understanding is that how do we make it easy for them to learn about these studies? Because I'll be honest, if I didn't, if I wasn't an active member of the community, I don't know if I'd be involved in Enroll HD. Not that I wouldn't want to, it's just how do I make sure? Yeah, I think it's right. I think it's how we publicize it. Uh, Lauren Byrne, for example, is trying to develop an at-home NFL testing Um, which we're going to test with her, which means people just can do a finger prick at home. uh, Mm -hmm. So they don't even have to go into a study center. And I think we have to get as many things like HDO. I think we need to get the word out there that getting involved in research will help future trials 
because we don't have the trials yet, but when they come, we will need hundreds and hundreds of young people in stage mm -hmm. zero and one to be part of them, to make them, to make them happen. Absolutely. And so, you know, with that being said, you mentioned FDA, which is the Food and Drug Administration in the US, and then the EMA, European Medical Agency. Medis Medicines Agency. Medicine. Um, what, can, what can we do as a community to help, you know, I know, yes, we can be involved in research, but what else, is there like anything else that we can do to really show like, you know, even just understanding risk benefit? So what I was going to say was um, when it comes to us wanting to plan a stage zero and one trial, and I will be very involved in that because it's been a 20 year passion of mine. If we get pushback from the FDA or the European Medicines Agency to say that um, uh, we don't think we, you should be doing trials in this group, then I would like to reach out to you, Seth, and to the HDO community to help me lobby the FDA and EMA to say we do want to have trials in this group. So that's where you can help, is help with the lobbying. Got you. We can do that for you. And I think that's so important. And We'll definitely, so that's we'll why we should better. keep in touch. You and I we should will. keep in touch because <laughs> yeah, will. I will uh, end up help getting you all to help me lobby. As long Absolutely. as we think the drug's safe, then I will be working with you to help me lobby. Because actually yeah. lobbying, lobbying from families uh, makes a huge difference. Yeah, we, we've seen it. I mean, I'm seeing it today in, in the ALS community. We've seen it in HIV. In SMA. We saw it SMA. in SMA. They managed to get SMA pushed fast. We even got it they in, were lobbied. Uh, in Duchenne as well. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, so we, we need to do that in our community. And young people are the way forward. I, I totally agree. I totally agree. And this was great. I mean, I think that's a thing, right? You know, it's, it's understanding the safety pieces. I 100% on board. I think what I would, you know, again, personally love to see is, you know, when we see the cancer space, right? And people are going through intensive chemotherapy, you know, there's still a chance it may not work, but they're like, well, it's better than the alternative, which is getting cancer. And I think that's, I would love, you know, one day the mindset would be the same where it's like, well, exactly. you know, I'm willing to take this risk. I know like if it's an oral pill or an IV, like I could always stop it, but it's better than maybe getting HD one day. And so that's exactly. the hope for me is like, can't let's try to push just like the cancer space push back. Well, back that's one. why we've done the staging system yeah. and stage zero is the group where there's nothing to find. And that's when we want to treat. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, this has been, this is great. Dr. Sarah Tabrizi, we appreciate the Thank update. you. I Thank think this you. Huge, huge, you know, even though it, it may sound a little bit confusing when if you, if you don't learn, if you like, if you don't hear it from you, like that was my first impression. I was like, I don't get this. What do I do? Right. But now after you explained it, I'm like, all right, it makes sense. And this is just a big, big, uh, I think moment that we're going to yeah. really look back This on. staging it, system it, is going to change the face of uh, research in Huntington's. Absolutely. Absolutely. So appreciate it again. And thank you. Uh, and best of yeah. luck with the rest of your meeting. Yes. Thank, thank you, you for inviting me, Seth, and keep in okay. touch. Yes, we'll be in touch for sure. And just for our last session, we do have the one and only Charles Sabine, who. Oh, will well, be there you go. I know who will be providing us uh, some with hope this, despite, uh, you know, somewhat of a, a rough last year or so. So definitely check that out if you can. And with that, we are all good to go. Brilliant. All the best. All right. Take care, guys. Bye. All right. Bye.